Well, it is a privilege to be here with you tonight and to worship the Lord and to hear the Word of God preached as we already have this evening by David Miller. And it is a joy knowing that many of you have come from some distance to be a part of this conference. And I'm very humbled by that to have some small way of being able to to minister to you. I commend you for your priorities and for seeking out a conference like this. Um, I'm very grateful for Praise Mill Baptist Church to host this and what a beginning this is. And I think Pastor Josh is onto something here. And uh, may God give it great success, not only in our lives, but uh, far beyond uh, our meeting here. To those who will listen, by live stream and by the tapes, and really to lay a foundation for future years, uh, future conferences held here. May God do that which He alone will receive glory and praise. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. The topic that has been assigned to me is why preach the intolerant message of the exclusive gospel. There are many texts to which I could draw our attention tonight. Uh, We could do a survey of the entire Bible. We could focus upon various key texts, but my, my heart is drawn to this text in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. The Apostle Paul, as he writes to the church, churches of Galatia, writes, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to disturb the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Again, the topic that has been assigned to me, why preach the intolerant message of the exclusive gospel demands a clear and emphatic answer in defense of the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. To be wrong here is to be wrong everywhere else that truly matters. To be wrong here is to be wrong about the saving mission and sin-bearing work of Christ. To be wrong here is to be wrong about the very nature of the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. To be wrong here is to be entirely wrong about the way of salvation that leads to God. To be wrong here is to pave the broad path that leads to eternal destruction and damnation. We must be unwavering in our assertion that the gospel is the only way of salvation. The entire Bible is staunchly and strictly assertive about this cardinal truth. From Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible speaks with one voice, and that without stuttering or stammering, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, 
and there is not one drop of saving grace outside of those three solas. Not one. The very essence of the gospel itself demands its exclusivity. Once you define the purity of the gospel, you automatically establish its exclusivity. The Bible lays down a zero-tolerance policy. For any equivocation outside of this singular message that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. To put it most succinctly, the Scripture is adamant that the gospel is the only way of salvation. Every other path is a path that leads to hell. If the gospel is not the only way to heaven, it is no way to heaven. If the gospel is not the way of salvation, it is not a way of salvation. And we're not just dogmatic about this, we are bulldogmatic about this. There are many passages to which we may turn to establish this cardinal truth. Uh, tonight we shall be in Galatians chapter 1. And with these opening verses, we quickly discover that the book of Galatians is Paul's most passionate, his most explosive letter. That this book is a powder keg of spiritual dynamite ready to detonate. Paul misses no words here. He breathes holy fire. In this letter, Paul is so consumed with fiery zeal regarding the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ that he abandons his normal practice of beginning by dictating the, uh, the letter to a secretary. Instead, Paul grabs the pen in hand himself, and he writes this letter with his own hand in letters so large that you could read them from the other side of the region. He says in Galatians 6, verse 11, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is clear that Paul is highly emotionally charged, and for very good reason. And so what has Paul so riled up, and what should have us so worked up. Well, the issue here is the gospel has come under siege. The gospel of grace has been corrupted in Galatia. It has been compromised. It has been perverted. It has been corrupted until it is no gospel at all. The gospel of grace had come under attack by false teachers known as the Judaizers, who had come into the church and mixed grace and law, works and faith. And these defilers of the truth claimed that salvation could be earned by keeping the law and that sanctification can be achieved by the flesh. And these perverters of the gospel sought to change salvation from no longer being a gift for the guilty, making it a reward for the righteous. So the Apostle Paul must fight the good fight for the very heart and soul of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you and I are living in days in which the gospel has come under assault again and again and again. And you and I must stand firm in grace and we too must stand strong that the gospel is the only way of salvation. I want us to look at this text. I want you to note four things with me from this text. I want you to note first Paul's amazement. Beginning in verse 6, Paul begins by expressing his astonishment over the Galatians. He, he is shocked by the Galatians. In verse 6, he begins, I am amazed. This word for amaze is a very strong word. It means to be astounded, to be bewildered, to be dumbfounded, to be shocked, uh, to be perplexed. Paul would say in the vernacular, you blow my mind, those of you there in Galatia. He says, I am amazed. I am I'm stunned. 
that you are so quickly deserting him. He is writing this to believers now. That you are so quickly deserting him. This word for deserting is a military term for a soldier abandoning his position or post. It means literally to go AWOL. When you should be on guard, when you should be on watch, when you should be alert, when you should be holding your ground, when you should be looking for the enemy, instead you are asleep and you are capitulating to the spirit of the age. They were deserting their loyalty, please note, to God himself. Look at this. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. To desert the gospel is to desert God himself. It's not just simply a system of theology, but God himself, who is the author of this theology. He says, you're turning your backs on God Almighty. You are a spiritual turncoat. You are defectors of of the worst kind as you have drifted away from the dock of sound doctrine. You are so quickly deserting him. The word quickly. Paul was just there. He had just told them to be on the alert so that this would not happen. And Paul is saying, I have no more left town after warning you that you have now so quickly deserted him. I want to say this again. To desert the gospel by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is to desert God himself. As John Piper has said, God is the gospel. God and the gospel are one. There is a solidarity between God and his gospel. Why is this? Because the greatest revelation of the glory of God has come shining forth to us through the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the glory of God that is at stake. That was Calvin's whole approach when he was run out of Geneva. And they called upon him to defend them against Rome after he had been run out by this very city. And he enters into a controversy with Sandaletto and his very pinpoint argument for justification by faith is, you at Rome corrupt the gospel and the glory of God. You desecrate the glory of God. He saw himself as a a defender of the glory of God. You have taken on the blasphemy of the glory of God. That is why Calvin was so worked up in the Reformation. That is why the Apostle Paul is so worked up here, because you are desecrating the glory of God. Every attribute of God is shining forth brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky, beaming and pouring through the cross and through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The greatest display of the holiness of God is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God is separated from sinners, and the only means by which Unholy sinners may come to holy God is through the mediation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, The wrath of God comes shining forth through the gospel that God poured out His wrath upon His own Son upon Calvary's cross. And only the damned in hell can even begin to imagine what Jesus suffered under the righteous wrath of God upon that cross. We see the grace of God shining forth as salvation is offered freely to sinners on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Every attribute of God, the truth of God, the immutability of God, the eternality of God, the righteousness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the truth of God, on and on and on. Every aspect of the greatness and the grandeur and the glory of God is put on fullest display in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
to equivocate on the gospel is to bring God under attack. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 6. I am amazed, shocked, stunned that you, believers in Galatia, are so quickly caving in and capitulating and deserting Him, God, who called you by the grace of Christ. God only calls sinners to Himself through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no call to salvation outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The entirety of God's saving work and saving enterprise is contained within the purity of the gospel of Christ. And there is no grace outside of the gospel, and there is no call of God to Himself outside of the gospel. Here, the gospel is defined as the grace of Christ, the free, unmerited, undeserved work of Christ upon Calvary's cross, bearing the sins of His people, suffering under the wrath of God, becoming a curse for us upon Calvary's cross, and there shedding His blood and pouring out His blood unto death to secure the eternal redemption and salvation of all those whom the Father had entrusted to Him. He says, you're deserting God who called you by the gospel of Christ for a different gospel. Could there be a different saving gospel? Could there be a different redeeming gospel? Could it be that God has one plan of salvation in the New Testament and He had a different one in the Old Testament? Uh, Could it be that God has one plan for Gentiles, but God has a different gospel for for Jews? Uh, Could it be that God has one gospel for those who hear the gospel and receive Christ, but a different way for those who who never hear. Paul says, I'm astonished, I'm amazed that you have deserted Him for a different gospel. This word different, do you see it there in your Bible? Heteros. It, It denotes another of a totally different kind. In other words, There really are only two gospels, the true gospel and the false gospel, the saving gospel and the non-saving gospel. And he says to them, you have equivocated with the true saving gospel in order to now be seduced by these false teachers for a different gospel. And this different gospel, Paul says and will tell us, is no gospel at all. It is a counterfeit gospel. It is a sham salvation. It is a fake message. It is a rip-off religion. It is a mangled message. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the end of death. Notice at the beginning of verse 7, as Paul continues with this astonishment, He's dumbfounded that you have given up diamonds for dirt, that you have given up the truth for a lie. He says, which is really not another. Paul is saying it's not a saving gospel. It is not a true gospel. And by saying this, Paul is absolutely emphatically asserting that there is only one way of salvation 
that there is only one saving gospel. He is asserting the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Positive assertion. Now, negative denial. No man comes unto the Father but through me. Peter, before the Sanhedrin, said, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The apostle Paul would write, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. Now, to desert this gospel is to to be removed from standing in the truth. What what, what is the true gospel? Look a couple verses earlier, just parenthetically for a moment. At the end of verse 3, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 4, who, personal pronoun, who, gave himself for our sins. There is substitutionary penal atonement as Jesus vicariously died in the place of sinners and in so doing gave himself unto death upon Calvary's cross for on the behalf of our sins results so that he might rescue us, deliver us, save us from this present age. This world is going to hell. This world is under judgment. This world is on a collision course with judgment on the last day. And Jesus Christ, by his death upon the cross, has rescued sinners from great danger. Even as Paul was astonished and amazed in the first century at how easily the Galatians were beguiled and seduced, Even so, we should be bewildered in this hour and in this day. When we see evangelicals sign the ECT document and pretend that there is no difference between the gospel of the Scripture and the gospel of Rome, we should be astonished and and amazed at those who would sign other documents who would cave in in order to put their arms around false teachers and false brethren as if there is no difference between what we believe and what they believe. We should be astonished as we have turned on television and so-called Christian leaders who have gone on the Larry King show, for example, in the past. Here is your moment. Here is your hour. Here is your opportunity to to preach the gospel to the nations. In one program, King said, we've had ministers on our program who said, you either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you you are going to heaven. And if you do not believe in Christ, you're not going to heaven. Well, I can tell you what minister said that. John MacArthur, Joel Osteen's answer, yeah, I I don't know. I'm reading the manuscript right here. I, I don't know. There's probably a balance. I believe you have to know Christ, but I... But I think if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. I think it's a cop-out to say, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything. That wasn't the question you were asked. You were asked the question, do you have to believe in Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven? King wouldn't let it go. Larry King said to Joel Osteen, what if you're Jewish? Now, Larry King is Jewish. Or if you're a Muslim, you don't have to accept Christ at all, do you? Olstein, you know, I'm, I'm very careful 
about saying who would or who wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. King, if you believe you have to believe in Christ, they're all wrong, aren't they? Osteen, I don't know. I spent a lot of time in India with my father. I don't know about all their religion, but I know they love God. No, they don't. They're God-haters. I know they love God. I don't know. I've seen their sincerity. I don't know. Our jaws should be on the ground. Although he's revealing himself to be what he truly is. One who denies the very gospel of Jesus Christ and the exclusivity of his shed blood for the atonement of sin. That's Paul's amazement. And I trust that none of us here tonight have passed the point of continually being shocked and amazed at who punts on first down when this question is put forth. Second, I want you to note Paul's adversaries. As we continue to read verse 7, not only Paul's amazement, but Paul's adversaries. He goes on to talk about only there are some who are disturbing you. These some refer to the false teachers, and it only takes some to create a big mess. Uh, The Judaizers are trying to bring their Jewish legalism into the church and distort the gospel, and whenever the gospel is distorted, there is no place to stand. You are are greatly disturbed. This word disturbed means to trouble, to agitate, to shake up. And the idea is that this false gospel is shaking up their allegiance to the one true gospel. In so doing, they are troubling the church says, there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort. Do you see that? Want to distort. And this word distort means to change something into its very opposite. It is a a total reversal. And he is saying they have totally reversed the gospel of grace into a gospel of works. Who want to distort the gospel, the one and only gospel of Christ. And in so doing, they pervert it and tamper it and dilute it. They were saying you have to keep the law and do your part in order to be righteous. You are justified by faith and works. You are sanctified by fleshly efforts. They were saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. You have to keep the Ten Commandments in order to be saved. You have to observe the holy days. You have to practice the ceremonial law. You must become like Jewish proselytes and submit to the Mosaic law in order to earn your way to God. There are many such adversaries of the gospel today. They acknowledge a place for the cross, but they deny the purity and the sufficiency and the finality and the exclusivity of the gospel. They claim that salvation is by faith and good works, by faith and water baptism, and by faith and church membership, or by faith and speaking in tongues, or faith and Hail Marys, or faith and the Mass, faith and last rites, faith and the treasury of merit, faith and buying indulgences. And then there are other adversaries of the gospel of a different kind. They are the cultists. They deny the Trinity. They deny the absolute deity of Christ. They deny the lordship of Christ. They deny the virgin birth, the sinless life, the substitutionary death, the bodily resurrection, the second coming. They deny the eternality of hell itself. They deny forensic imputation of the perfect righteousness of Christ to those who believe. 
And these adversaries of the gospel claim that there are many ways of salvation, many ways to God. They preach tolerance of all religions as long as one is sincere and loving to all. But they say, peace, peace, where there is no peace. They are blind leaders of the blind. They are clouds without water, trees without fruit, wandering stars for whom black darkness has been reserved forever. They are ear ticklers who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. They clean the outside of the cup, but inside they are full of robbery. They are whitewashed tombs who are dead men's bones on the inside. So what will Paul say to this? What is the mind of God that needs to be pronounced on such a corruption of the gospel? Look at verses 9 and 10. I want you to see third, Paul's anathemas. These false teachers, the Judaizers, who sought to undermine the saving mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul has some very strong words for them in verse 8. Let these words sink deeply into our minds tonight and into our souls. Paul begins in verse 8 by putting forth an extreme hypothetical situation in order to make his point. So in verse 8 he says, but even if we... Now this is hypothetical. Paul will never abandon the gospel. But he says, even if we, referring to himself, or to Barnabas, or to Timothy, or to Luke, even if we, or an angel from heaven, perhaps Michael or Gabriel or one of the chief angels, and one of the living angels, one of the guardian angels, one of the seraphim, one of the cherubim, any one of the elect angels should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, Paul says, and his emotions now, are, are seething. He says, he is to be accursed. He is to be damned. He is to be condemned by God forever. Now, this word accursed is the word anathema, which means to be devoted to destruction. He is to be consigned to the flames of hell below. He is to be damned. To put it bluntly, he is to go to hell before he can take anyone else with him. Martin Luther put it this way in his commentary on the Galatians. Here Paul is breathing fire. His zeal is so fervent that he almost begins to curse the angels themselves. Close quote. Now, there is no room for neutrality, no room for passivity here. This is a time for the man of God to step forward to pronounce the mind of God. James Montgomery Boyce, a great champion of the faith and of the gospel, wrote years ago, How can it be otherwise? If the gospel Paul preaches is true, then both the glory of Jesus Christ and the salvation of men are at stake. If men can be saved by works, Boyce writes, Christ has died in vain. The cross is emptied of meaning. If men are taught a false gospel, they are being led from one thing that can save them and are being turned to destruction. Close quote. How true are these words spoken by Boyce? Those who corrupt the one saving gospel contribute to the damnation of lost souls who follow their message. It was Jesus himself who said in Matthew 18, verse 6, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Close quote. As if Paul has not said enough, he reloads in verse 9. He backs off just to get a running start 
to harpoon this heresy yet again. So notice what he says in verse 9. He could have just said it one time in verse 8 and moved on. Everything that Paul says is of extreme importance. Paul now restates what he just said so that there would be no question about what you heard him say as you read this. Verse 9, as we have said before. In other words, I told you when I was there. I told you there was only one way of salvation. I told you Jesus Christ is the only Savior of sinners. I told you justification by faith alone is the way that God has saved. I told you that's how He saved in the Old Testament with Abraham. I told you that's how He saved you now in the New Testament, that there is only one gospel. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now. In other words, if you didn't get it the first time, you're bound to get it now. If any man, verse 9, be he an apostle, be he an angel, be he a, some self-appointed religious zealot, if any man is preaching, present tense, indicating this is an ongoing crisis in the church at Galatia right now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received and you received it from me because God gave it directly to me and I gave it to you, any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, he is, this, this, this is shocking. This is stunning what Paul says. But it has to be this way. He is to be accursed. This word accursed speaks to the seriousness of entertaining any idea that there is a way of salvation outside of by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Paul says such a false teacher should go to hell and will go to the hottest part of hell that is reserved for false teachers who distort the gospel of Jesus Christ and poison the hearts and the minds of others. I would remind all of us tonight that what Paul has to say here, he is putting it on the front porch of this letter. This is not in chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. He works his way into this argument and then pulls out the sledgehammer and makes this audacious statement. Paul no more than signs his name to the opening salutation and makes a beeline. What is in his heart comes spewing out like a, an erupting volcano with white uh, lava of truth spewing forth on the very, at the very outset of this book where Paul would normally say something like, I thank my God for you, or you, would, you are in my every thought, or I pray for you constantly, or I thank God for your faith and your hope and your love. There is none of this. Paul is not thankful. He is not thankful for what is going on in Galatia. He is rightly filled with holy zeal because the high ground of the gospel has been forfeited and instead of his normal pastoral platitudes, there is only this open public rebuke. What further makes this so exasperating is that Paul had just been there and he had just told them this. Paul's anathemas continue to come down to this present day. The apostolic message continues to pronounce the heavy hand of divine judgment upon all who add to the gospel, to all who subtract from the gospel, to all who compromise the gospel, to all who twist the gospel, to all who delude the gospel, 
Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are not sincere. They are ravenous wolves. And they are after you. Finally, I want you to see Paul's aim in verse 10. We've seen Paul's amazement. We've seen his adversaries. We've seen his anathemas. I want you to see his aim in verse 10, and then we're finished. Paul now comes down to the bottom line. Paul is not finished. He asks a soul-searching question that should sift every heart in the churches of Galatia. He asks a question that should sift through every conscience and every heart here tonight. He says in verse 10, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If Paul were seeking the favor of men, he would certainly tone down his rhetoric, would he not at this point? But he is not courting the approval of men. He desires his amens to come out of heaven. He is certainly not courting the approval of the Judaizers, nor anyone who is sympathetic to their corrupt message. Instead, Paul is seriously seeking the approbation of God and God alone, and he is saying there is no middle ground. Either we seek men or we seek God. It can't be both ways. Paul would put it this way, if you please God, it does not matter whom you displease, but if you displease God, it does not matter whom you please. Did you get that? That is the ultimatum. That is the fork in the road. That is what Paul is pressing to the hearts of the Galatians and to our hearts here tonight. And men-pleasers are ear-ticklers. Men-pleasers broaden the road that is headed for destruction. But God-pleasing preachers God pleasing preachers preach the narrow gate. They preach the narrow road. They preach that few there be that find it. They preach the necessity of repentance. They preach the lordship of Jesus Christ. And they say things like, if any man shall come after me, he must hate his own father and mother and brother and sister, yes, even his own life, or he cannot, cannot be my disciple. If any man shall come after me, he must deny himself, take up a cross, and follow after me. That's what God-pleasing preachers and elders and deacons and teachers and mamas and daddies and believers uphold. If I were still trying to please men, and that's what Paul did before he was converted. He said, I would not, I could not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Bottom line, this is either or, never both and. This is mutually exclusive, never mutually inclusive. Either we seek to please men, and we therefore displease God, or we seek to please God, and in the process, we will always be those who displease men who want an easy religion that will take them to hell. Paul would say, I was chosen by God, I was called by God, I was set apart by God, I was saved by God, redeemed by God, commissioned by God, instructed by God, appointed by God. Why on earth would I now suddenly want to please men? In the last day, it will be before God that we will stand. 
we will be judged by God and either rewarded or passed over for those rewards by God, but it is God whom we must please. We live in an hour not unlike the first century in which the gospel remains under constant assault from the cults, from false religions, from the Roman Catholic Church, from new perspective on Paul, from non-lordship advocates, from social gospel proponents, from universalists, and from many others. There are many attacks upon the gospel in this hour. Our feet must be firmly planted upon this solid ground that Jesus is the only way of salvation. Therefore, we must take the gospel to the streets because there is no salvation apart from this gospel. We must get on planes. We must get on airplanes. We must cross the seas. We must scale mountains. We must cross deserts. We must go to the ends of the earth and take this one saving gospel message to those who are perishing without Christ, who have no salvation without Christ. Jesus is the only way of salvation. No one else has been born of a virgin and lived a sinless and perfect life. No one else can give me His perfect righteousness. No one else has died in my place, bearing my sins and carried them far away. No one else has suffered the wrath of God, deserving me in my place. No one else has appeased God's righteous anger towards me. No one else has reconciled me to holy God. No one else has redeemed me out of the slavery to sin and to Satan. No one else has washed my sins away. No one else has been raised for my justification. No one else has seated me in heavenly places. No one else has presented me faultless before the throne of God. Not Buddha, not Allah, not Mary, not the Pope, not some Unitarian being, not Joseph Smith, not Mary Baker Eddy. There is only one who is the champion of our salvation. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we are jealous for His name and we are zealous for the honor and the glory that belongs to Him alone, we will preach His eternal saving message till the end of the age. And we are persuaded that there is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Have you come to believe upon Jesus Christ? Have you seen the emptiness of life without Christ? Do you understand that you're under the wrath of God without Christ? Do you understand that there is no hope for your soul without Christ? Do you understand that it's appointed and a man wants to die and after this the judgment? Do you understand that you'll stand before God and the books will be open and every eye, sinful thought, sinful act, sinful words, it will all come dancing out like skeletons out of a closet? Let me tell you, you need an advocate. You need one to undertake your case. You need one who will save you from the wrath to come, if you have never believed upon Jesus Christ, I call you this moment, this night, to commit your very life to Jesus Christ, to embrace Him as Lord and Savior. Come and humble yourself before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from this world. Run to Christ. Flee to Christ. He loves to take in sinners. He died for sinners. Him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. You will find a reception with him who is the friend of sinners. Run to Christ and be saved. Let us pray. Father, set these words that Paul has penned deep, deep into our souls. Let us earnestly contend for the faith 
once and for all delivered to the saints. Let us be white hot, red hot. Let us be worked up. Let us be passionate. Let us be zealous. Let us stand with Paul and proclaim the gospel and defend it against all her enemies. Father, we pray that you would give us great grace in these dark days to be able to be the, light, the lampstand that you've called us to be, to set forth the only message of salvation that there is under heaven, that Jesus Christ has come into this world to save sinners, of which we all are foremost and chief. Father, we pray this in his blessed name. Amen.